Um, I want to start with a quick history of Propel, uh, and, and I'm going to focus a little bit on how we've responded to crises in the past, because I think that's a, a good introduction to um, why we felt the need to do something now and, uh, and how that um, sort of shaped up. Um, so quick introduction for those of you who don't know, Propel is a uh, small software company. We're based in downtown Brooklyn normally. Uh, the team is about 29 people today. Um, we build modern, respectful, effective technology that helps low-income Americans improve their financial health. Um, we got started through an incubator program uh, run by the Robin Hood Foundation. So we, we have our roots in the nonprofit sector, um, but we then went on to raise uh, uh, venture money uh, and have a, have a mix of um, traditional VC uh, backers as well as some impact, uh, impact investors like the Omidyar Network uh, and the Financial Health Network. Um, we, uh, when I joined the company about four and a half years ago, um, we were focusing on a slightly different product and uh, adjacent problem within SNAP. We were trying to make it easier for people to apply for benefits. Um, and uh, Jimmy, the founder, and I spent a lot of time in uh, uh, grocery stores in North Philly help, uh, trying to get people to sign up for benefits using this tool that we had built. Um, but most people that we talked to told us that they were actually there to spend their benefits and that they were already enrolled. Um, and so we started asking people questions about what it was like to manage benefits on an EBT card. Um, and, uh, and we learned a lot of really interesting things and, and pretty quickly realized that there were a lot of additional pain points um, in the process of getting and, and receiving and managing SNAP benefits uh, that went beyond just, just enrolling in benefits in the first place. Um, and we thought for a, for a company that was trying to build kind of sticky uh, technology products, that was a really compelling value proposition. Uh, and so we, we decided to build um, what started out as a simple balance checking app for the EBT card uh, because we learned that um, the people that we were talking to had a really bad experience when it came to managing the, the benefits on their, uh, on their cards. Um, you're talking about 40 million people in the United States who get food stamps. Um, so that's about 20 million households have an EBT card. Uh, and most of those people uh, at the time were calling the 1-800 number on the back of that card every time they went grocery shopping um, and at the beginning of the month when they were waiting for their benefits to arrive. Uh, and we thought that was really silly in an era where most of those people had smartphones and were probably, probably managing some other sort of financial relationship uh, on that smartphone. Um, and so we looked at uh, the way the system was built and decided that, that, we, could, uh, that we could do this. Uh, and so we pretty quickly um, built an app that worked in, in one state, um, sitting as sort of a skin on top of the state uh, EBT system. Um, and then we scaled that up to all 50 states within the first, I think, four months uh, so that we could push out kind of a national app. This is, you know, the app for anybody with an EBT card. Uh, and where we landed was with Fresh EBT. So um, today, Fresh EBT is uh, what we think is the top finance app for low-income Americans. Uh, over 2 million families manage the, the benefits on their EBT card using our product. Um, there are all sorts of other features and resources built into the tool. Uh, so we've got a couponing feature to help people save money on groceries. Um, we've built a job board to help people find work. Uh, and our, uh, the revenue that we generate is from ads from mission aligned uh, companies that, that um, offer our, our users products and services to help them save money or earn income. So we work with large employers who are looking to hire our users. We work with big companies like Comcast who offer discounted internet access to low-income families. Uh, and and we, we screen um, pretty carefully to make sure that the products and services that we promote are things that are actually good for our users' financial lives. Um, at the bottom, you can see a screenshot that I pulled yesterday. Uh, we, we are currently ranking as the top, uh, as the f number five free finance app on the Google Play Store, uh, uh, surrounded by um, a, a, what I think is, a, is a, an impressive list for a, for a small, uh, small team. Um, and I think it just demonstrates the, the, both the size of the population and the unmet need that, uh, that we identified um, early on. Um, and I think also, you know, we're not normally number five, and I'll get back to this later, but, uh, you know, in times of uh, financial stress and any time that there are changes to benefits, uh, we tend to see a big spike in demand for um, a product that provides clear and consistent, transparent, um, and accurate information about benefits and, and things that are changing. Um, so, uh, so I want to go on and cover kind of uh, the history of, of how uh, we as Propel have responded to various crises that we have um, 
seen in our in our user base because uh, I think that's sort of the, the best foundation for understanding the, the work with GiveDirectly today. Um, as a foundational point, I think, uh, and this may seem obvious, but low-income households tend to be disproportionately affected by crises of all sorts, and it's especially true for financial shock. So we've all seen the statistics around the percentage of households who don't have $400 saved to weather a basic financial shock, uh, and that's true of basically all of our users. Um, the first time we saw this was in hurricane season 2017. Uh, we were um, a little baby company and a little baby product, and... Um, in in four days, we uh, 4X'd our daily active users in the state of Florida uh, after Hurricane Irma hit. Um, and, uh, and we had no idea what was happening, really, because we didn't know anything about this world. But what we realized was that uh, the state had announced some changes to benefits that allowed um, people who were getting SNAP to get uh, replacement benefits for any food that they had lost in the hurricane or from power outages, and that they had authorized people... Uh, to use their EBT card for hot foods. So normally you can only use SNAP benefits to buy um, food that you would prepare at home. Uh, but in a, in a hur after a hurricane, when people, a lot of people are displaced from their homes or they don't have power, uh, the state can actually get a waiver to uh, allow people to use their benefits for hot foods. And what we saw was this enormous spike in activity um, because changes to benefits uh, create uncertainty and people look for um, clarity in those situations and they started coming to us for um, for that information and, and it felt like a really good opportunity for us to try to provide that information and so we we basically took over the home screen of the app as you can see here um, and and provided you know the most accurate inf information that we could get from the state uh, about what was happening to benefits um, that has happened in every hurricane season since but uh, I won't go into too much more detail about hurricanes um, so last year in the government shutdown, um, there were some pretty significant changes to SNAP uh, that ended up having a really, really significant impact on our users and, and I think was another really important opportunity for us to step up and respond. So um, with, the, with the shutdown extending through, uh, through January, uh, the government was realizing that they were going to have a hard time paying out February SNAP benefits on the normal schedule in February. And so as a, as a creative workaround, um, they authorized the early disbursement of SNAP benefits to every recipient in the country who was going to get benefits in February. Benefits were instead pushed out uh, in late January. I think it was January 20th. Uh, and that was a workaround that allowed the government to fund the program through the shutdown um, when they wouldn't have been able to actually send benefits out in, in February. Um, unsurprisingly, this created massive confusion. Uh, people thought they were getting extra benefits. They thought it was a mistake. Um, and the, the normal schedule, so if you, you know, every state has a different schedule for depositing benefits, um, those schedules were totally disrupted for many months in, uh, in some cases as states shifted back to the normal distribution cycle. Um, and you know, at this point, we knew that uh, people were relying on Fresh EBT for, for timely and accurate information about benefits. Uh, and so that was, that was the first thing that we tried to do is make sure that people understood exactly what this additional deposit was. Um, and the most important point being, these are your February benefits. They have to last you through the deposit that you will hopefully get in March. Um, and at the time, we actually couldn't say that with any certainty because we didn't know how long the shutdown was, was going to last. But um, we basically had to say, you need to you know, make these benefits last as long as you possibly can. Um, uh, so that was that was sort of step one was make sure people have the information about what was happening. Um, and again, we saw a, a huge increase in uh, in traffic as soon as these changes were announced uh, that lasted basically through May when when states resumed the normal schedule. Um, the next thing we did was try to find resources to uh, to get our users help. So we knew that some people were going to spend their benefits uh, quickly. And by the time uh, they were supposed to get their March benefits, they wouldn't have any food left. Um, so in this case, we partnered with an organization called Feeding Children Everywhere, which had just recently launched a, um, like a meal kit service for, uh, for low-income households called Full Cart. Uh, and it was basically a really cheap box of, um, of food, uh, of, of shelf-stable food. Uh, I think it was something like 100 meals in a box. Uh, that they, they could order for like $12. Uh, and we raised a bunch of money and basically sent a bunch of these boxes out for free to users who signed up and said that they needed uh, extra food help. Um, it wasn't much. Uh, I can't remember how many we sent out, but we raised something like $200,000 and sent a bunch of food to families that, that needed help. 
Um, but the work that I'm that I'm most proud of in this situation was actually uh, a, a quick feature that we that we built. Um, so we have a long history of working with some behavioral economists at a, an organization called the Common Sense Lab, uh, who who had convinced us that information isn't enough. You can't just tell people you got to try to make your benefits last. You have to you have to give somebody a, a tool to actually do that. And so we pretty quickly built a a feature that allowed people to hide some of their benefits uh, and then have those benefits show back up in their balance um, at the you know w- when they might otherwise get their February deposit. Um, and so we had something like 40,000 people use this feature and successfully like stash money away for, for later in the, um, for later in the month when they would otherwise be getting those benefits. Um, and so that brings us to today. So, um, in, I guess, mid March, we started hearing from our users about some of the, uh, concerns that they were having around the coronavirus, uh, and, and then pretty quickly thereafter started hearing about job losses. Um, and, uh, and then the impact of, of schools closing, I think, was really profound for our users, most of whom are um, moms. Uh, and so once kids were home from school, um, anybody who, who was working, if they hadn't been laid off, was having to either make costly arrangements or stay home from work so that they could take care of their children. Um, and this was where, where we started seeing the immediate need for trying to, to get financial assistance to people. Um, 86% of the people who use our product who were employed at some point in 2020 have lost earnings due to coronavirus. Um, and, uh, you know, mo- many of those were, were, were laid off entirely. Others had hours cut. Uh, and as I mentioned, many had to stay home um, because they, they couldn't leave their kids at home. Um, we also started seeing changes being talked about to, to SNAP, which led to the, the classic increase in our, in our daily active user traffic. Um, a lot of states have increased the benefit allotment for March and April. Um, states have authorized something called pandemic EBT, which is a way to put the funds for school meals onto the EBT card. A bunch of states have uh, moved quickly to accept EBT for online payments, uh, which didn't used to be allowed for Amazon and Walmart. Um, and then we started realizing that a bunch of our users were not going to be eligible for stimulus checks because they don't file taxes. Uh, and so we, we, tried to get the right information to people about filing taxes as quickly as possible. So again, the information was the first reaction of, of you know, we have 2 million people who have some uncertainty and some confusion about what's happening right now. Let's get timely and accurate information about benefits first to, to our users. Um, but then, you know, we started thinking about what are the ways that we can mobilize other resources to help in a time of crisis. Um, And at first we thought about, could we just raise money ourselves um, and try to distribute cash through, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different uh, mechanisms, Uh, but it felt too complicated and risky for us to take that on. Uh, And we knew that there were organizations that, that can do that better. Uh, And so give directly was the natural um, partner that came to mind there. Um, They are uh, an organization that I personally have, have supported and known for a long time. Um, and, uh, and we reached out and, and basically said that we wanted to do something, but that we didn't have the capabilities that they had, uh, when it comes to actually getting payments out to people and raising money. Uh, and what we had was, um, an enormous, uh, demand for help, uh, and that we could aggregate that and we could, uh, target it and we could screen, uh, but that we needed, we needed help on the other two fronts. Um, and it, it became pretty clear that, uh, that give directly had exactly the, the, um, the competencies that we lacked in fundraising capabilities in, in the ability to push payments out to people in a track record of getting cash to a lot of people who need it. Uh, and so I think we, we realized that the, um, the partnership made a lot of sense. Uh, within about a week, maybe 10 days of the initial conversation, we started our first enrollment. We got 200 people uh, signed up. Uh, they were sent prepaid cards um, in the mail, and then they opened their Fresh UBT app to let us know that they had received the card, uh, and they were funded uh, within, a, within a day or two of letting us know that. Um, and, uh, and then we have subsequently switched to a digital payment gateway, and we're now in a cadence of enrolling um, a few hundred to a few thousand people every week, depending on how much money we have been raising uh, and pushing those out through this digital payment gateway as people sign up in, in Fresh UBT. Um, targeting the, the states that have been um, hardest hit uh, by coronavirus, um, but also we are, we're doing some targeting based on where, uh, where donors are located or interested in, in supporting. Um, so with that, I will turn it to Michael to, uh, to give an introduction to GiveDirectly and their work and, uh, and why they believe in, in cash. 